Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's gathering, uh, today's event on the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, uh, and today's 40, today's 40 Days Live event. We are very glad you're here. Um, today's gathering is on reflecting on ancestors and being Métis, and it will be featuring Penny Nelson and Brian Nelson. My name is Adele Halliday. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. And uh, again, we're glad you're here. Uh, we'll start the live event in just a few moments, but first, just a bit of background about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism in case this is your first gathering. This live event is part of a 40-day program uh, that has daily written reflections each day with the exception of Sundays. And each day's reflection offers opportunities for learning, faith reflection, and ideas for action. And all of the writings were written by people across the United Church, and the reflections are posted on the website one week at a time. These live events are running each Tuesday and are being recorded so they can be viewed at any time. And as well, there are books. There are featured anti-racism books each week that are in the United Church Bookstore. This week's book is called The Other Side of the River, From Church Pew to Sweat Lodge. It was written by um, Alf Dumont. And Alf served as United Church of Canada minister for 40 years in several churches and was the director of the Sandy Soto Spiritual Center, which is an Indigenous theological center of the United Church. And in the book, Alf challenges the church to re-examine the theology behind some of its past decisions around residential schools to better live out the words of its apology. And Alf also challenges the country to re-examine its responsibilities and relationships with Indigenous peoples. And he uses stories and humor and poetry and insights um, to share his wisdom. So if you're interested in picking up a copy of this book, um, the link is here in the chat for the United, uh, United Church Bookstore. And uh, you can use the, the code 40 days to um, receive orders of, sorry, you can use the code 40 days to receive 20% off orders of two or more books up until November 30th. Um, just a few uh, more things before we get to the speaker. Um, the speakers, if you would like to follow the full 40 days of engagement on anti-racism, um, the link here is in the chat as well. Um, there's a weekly newsletter uh, for sign up um, in case you want to follow, get some of the highlights that are happening around the 40 days. The newsletter comes out every Thursday. And um, uh, again, to receive, if you're interested in the book bookstore discounts, the code is 40 days. So now, without further ado, let us go to our speakers, um, Penny Nelson and Brian Nelson. Uh, so Penny Nelson uses she, her pronouns, and is a, or, an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada. She lives in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, with her wife, Nicole, and their calico cat, Minouche. And true to her upbringing, Penny still tries to grow, forage, and make as much of her own food as possible, and seeks ways to slow down and listen to Creator's voice by listening to the land. Brian Nelson uses he, him pronouns, and Brian is Penny's dad. Brian is a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta. He's an old hippie who is passionate about environmentalism and social justice issues. And he lives on his family farm with his wife, Colleen, and their sister, Sean. So welcome to Penny and Nelson. We're glad you're here. Um, and please engage us in the conversation. Thanks, Adele. Welcome, folks. I'm really glad to see all of you here. As we begin our time together today, I'll, a little bit of introduction, um, an explanation about how things are going to go. So I, as Adele said, currently live in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, although um, I originally grew up near Camrose, Alberta. And my dad, Brian Nelson, is currently located in uh, what used to be my bedroom, <laughs> but is now converted into the sewing room in my parents' house near Camrose, Alberta. But earlier in October, um, my parents were visiting me here in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. And so my dad and I were able to pre-record a conversation together based around um, the reflection that I wrote for the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. And so today, what is going to happen is we are going to watch um, some recordings of that conversation that my dad and I had, 
And then um, we'll come back to this Zoom room to be able to have some questions and answers live, either with myself or my dad and with you folks. And then we'll head back into um, the video to watch another piece and then come back again for live questions. Uh, I think that was all that I had to say about process. And my dad is going to talk to us a little bit more before we begin about um, a definition of what it means to be Métis. So there's, like Penny says, a definition. This is pretty simple, and uh, it's not as in depth as you might get if you actually were with a group of Métis people arguing about who they were. So the Métis people are an indigenous, indigenous nation that is recognized as one of the founding peoples of Canada in the Constitution. Um, we are a mixture of European settlers and traders and various indigenous peoples. The nation spread from British Columbia to Northern Ontario down into the Dakotas into the States. You may notice a blue flag, blue and white flag behind me. That's the flag for the Métis Nation of Alberta. And it really reflects the concept of infinity. And what we're trying to get across with our flag is that we were here in the past, we are here now, and no matter what anybody tries to do, we're still going to be here in the future. And uh, so, you know, we can debate many, many fine points of the definition, but I think that's good enough for a working uh, conversation today. Thanks, Dad. So before we go into our first video, um, I have been told that um, it's helpful for the best video quality for all of us to turn off our videos, uh, like our, our webcams while we're watching the video, just so that um, those of us with slower internet can actually watch this video the best. So without further ado, we'll head into our first video. Tanchi Kiwo. Penny Nelson Dishin Akasham. Cameros, Alberta, Oshinia, Maka, Wolfville, Nova Scotia, Niwikenequa. Enfam Machipnia. Le Prudens, P. Le Norns, P. Le Whitford, P. Le Desjardins, Ma Parenti, Kayashoshche. Hi, folks. My name is Penny. And my name is Brian. Both of us are Metis. And um, just a quick recap, <laughs> I introduced myself to you in one of the traditional languages of the Métis people, which is Michif, including uh, my, my ancestral names of the Prudens, the Norns, the Whitfords, and the Desjardins. So, Penny, what do these names mean to you? What's the importance of the names and being named? For me, I think the importance of my family names say that I belong, not in lots of different ways. So <laughs> I belong to our family. I belong to long lines of people. Also because of those particular family names, what it has always said to me, even before I knew what those names were, was that I belong to the land. I feel that in my heart in a really special way in the prairies that I belong here. And when, when you really started to uncover more about mm -hmm. our Métis ancestry, a whole lot more about my own particular life made sense about why I feel like I belong to the land in the prairies. And I also feel like I belong to a wider community. So when I say, these are my names, that means I can call myself Métis from Red River. Yes. And yeah, and there are, there's a bigger group of people to which I belong. So that's what my names mean to me. What about you, Dad? What do your... What do our names and what do your names mean to you? For me, the long list of names puts me in my time and space, but it also identifies what my family's time and space was. So that it's not really very much different than a, a 
typical conversation meeting a new person in a rural area where you yeah. say your name and then you identify who your parents were and you may even identify who your grandparents were and then roughly give your geographic area so I'm you know 10 kilometers from Round Hill mm -hmm. sort of thing uh, in that I think that and then we have a conversation about well are we related to this family or that family and is there a, a connection and who married who and, yeah and that conversation could go on for quite some time before you actually are done <laughs> saying hello uh, but all of those things make your connections known to the other person with our uh, Métis names, it puts us in an original spot. Mm -hmm. So it starts from the Red River settlement. And then we, if people are knowledgeable about their own background, we may start to talk about uh, the Beaver Hills uh, uh, settlement or... Which uh, is a particular part of in, Alberta where our family settled for a while. And there was a collection of Métis, other Métis families there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, and then uh, the Lesser Slave Lake area. Mm -hmm. And you know, th those, those family connections are then made. And bonds are created almost instantly uh, with that other person because you have a, you know you have a similar background and a, you're from a similar area. Mm -hmm. So those connections are what's important to me about our, our names and our genealogy. Yeah. It also sort of validates uh, our claim to being Métis. And I think that's quite important nowadays as, as people are learning what Métis means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's more and more conversations about race shifting. Yeah. And people who are claiming that they are Indigenous, whether First Nations or Métis or perhaps Inuit, when they really aren't. Mm -hmm. So to be able to say and to prove these are our historic family names means there is a place for us here. I feel quite comfortable within myself about my claim to Métis status, yeah. but for some reason there seems to be an increasing need to prove yourself. Yeah. Which is both good and bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I am curious about, in the piece that I wrote for the 40 Days of Engagement mm -hmm. on Anti-Racism, I wrote about how our Métis heritage wasn't talked about pretty much at all when I was growing up. And I wonder, was it talked about when you were growing up? Did you grow up knowing that you were Métis? Well, <laughs> yes and no. Yeah. Um, there was no, uh, my family was not politicized in uh, a racial way in that we really grew up thinking people were people. Uh, but and you grew up when and where? Oh, so I, uh, I was born in 1955. So when I would first start to really remember sort of family relations and gatherings, it would have been about 1960s and 70s. In central Alberta. In central Alberta. And um, in a farming community surrounded by a mm, totally white population. Mm -hmm. um, and the weird thing for me was... I, uh, our, f our branch of the family was probably the most Caucasian in its features, but my, many of my cousins, uncles, aunties, they were all obviously Aboriginal, mm -hmm. but we never talked about. Meaning the, they had darker skin or what do you mean? Uh, dark hair, dark eyes, dark skin. Um, uh, even their speech was perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, had a bit of an accent to it mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But that didn't really seem to matter to anybody within the family. Uh, the other thing was that I don't really believe that they were um, had any sense of Métis as a nation identification. Um, and very little knowledge about our long family history. It did go back a couple of generations to grandma and great grandpas. But there's very little talked about um, anything sort of beyond further back than that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they were aware that they could officially identify themselves as Métis. It wasn't until my uncle, my, well, my great uncle and auntie uh, became very active in the Métis nation 
that they started trying to raise the awareness of, to the rest of us cousins. Um, and very few of the my mother's generation yet have not identified themselves as Métis, but my cousins actually are, uh, some of them are quite passionate about the, the causes that are important to uh, the Métis people. So I didn't figure it out until 2018 when my auntie at a family gathering uh, really challenged directly mm -hmm. the group of cousins. We were just playing music and having fun and, uh, and she sort of stepped into that circle and said, what's wrong with you guys? Don't you know? Yada, yada, yada. And we all sort of went, no, we don't know. <laughs> and we had a, a weekend of education there. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful to her for doing that. So uh, my mom had a whole different reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I've talked to her about that before she passed on. And uh, so uh, our larger family was very poor. Um, yeah, poorest of the poor. <laughs> uh, food was a constant issue. Uh, keeping the home quarter mortgage paid for was a challenge. And my mom really felt deprived. And in some ways she she blamed her own mother and father about that in that they they really really never really tried in her mind terribly hard to to get out of that uh deeply cla deep poor class and um so she resolved that she was going to be successful she was going to have a career and she was going to work her way into a well-paid job mm -hmm. and she told me very bluntly that it was enough of a. It was hard enough as a woman in the '60s to rise through the the ranks in a corporate structure. Um, at the time, she was paid 30% less for the same job that the men in her office were were doing. Yeah. Um, and she really didn't think that she would have a chance. Um, if she also identified herself as a Métis woman. Mm -hmm. By that time, she had really delved into her own family and had done the genealogy and worked her way back into our family history and was very proud of it and was identifying and recognizing that, yes, she was a Métis, but she thought it would just kill her career. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty obvious in her office environment that there was not much respect for Aboriginal people at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it was white, middle-aged men, and uh, they, they definitely had their opinions about women and uh, other races. Yeah. And so she just dropped the idea. She just said she put it behind her. Um, and I think both of us felt a little sad about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then really before uh, she had a chance to decide to do anything about it, um, she passed away. Mm -hmm. Um, how about you? It wasn't really talked about in our family. Yeah, it, <laughs> being Métis wasn't really talked about in our family. And that was when you finally received your citizenship from the Métis Nation mm -hmm. of Alberta. That was a mind-blowing event <laughs> for for me um because i i remember you saying i don't think there's enough cree blood mm -hmm. in us to count and so i found that whole i there were a couple of years there where i was really confused and angry and not yeah having to do a lot of unlearning and mm -hmm. relearning myself but also what I've come to what I've come to realize over the past five to seven years is that even if our Metis heritage wasn't talked about, that doesn't mean that we didn't live it. Very much so. Yeah. And like I I have specific memories of grandma teaching me how to harvest medicines and berries and how to prepare rosehip tea and things mm -hmm. like that. And you could say, 
well, maybe any farm wife of that generation would have known these things, but I'm not so sure about that. I don't think so. Yeah, and the fact that Grandma specifically said, this, I'm teaching you this because this is what my grandma taught me when I was your age. Mm -hmm. And her grandma was Métis. To me now, when I look back on it, I think that was Grandma Evelyn's quiet way of trying to teach me how to be Métis without actually saying, P.S. this is how you be Métis. <laughs> without really naming it. Yeah. Yeah. And that would have been the safest thing to do. Yes. Yeah. So that the values and the practices were instilled in a future generation. But if we could still pass for white, then we could be successful. Mm -hmm. Whatever. And yeah, I, I'm really grateful to grandma for passing on the bits of culture that she did and that she could. And yeah, it makes me, I mostly just feel sad about yeah. the fact that she didn't feel like she could talk more about our Métis culture or mm -hmm. pass on more because like when you were growing up metis kids were being scooped right along oh, yeah. with first nations kids right and you've talked about having family members cousins second cousins you don't even know who they were who were just like dropped off at your yes. house to live for weeks or months and then picked up again when their parents felt like they could Things had blown over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fostering was really common in our family, as because mom was successful, we were uh, yeah. a little better off. There was, yeah. you know, there were extra clothes and there was a, an extra room in the house, and mm -hmm. and so most of the time, most of my childhood, there was one or two other kids living with us. Yeah, and they they'd stay for sometimes as long as a year or two, and yeah. sometimes a lot less, but. Uh, so passing yeah. came with some losses as well as with some responsibilities to mm -hmm. the family. Very much. Yeah, because grandma was able to ha be more financially secure than some of her yeah. other brothers and sisters. And so that meant that she and grandpa, who was Norwegian and yeah. Swedish, <laughs> that they just take care of family when they could and how they could. The uh, thing when you were talking about when uh, we had talked about not enough Cree. In yeah. Me, that was in a time when I was ignorant and I didn't know any better. So I thought blood quantum, the idea of how much Métis you were, probably mattered. Mm -hmm. And even then there was this, um, some posers <laughs> who who were uh, pretending to be Aboriginal, and you know th their claim may have been one thirty second Cherokee, right? And that was brought out in in their public shaming. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, you know, we probably don't qualify. So why look? It wasn't until my auntie or great auntie really, uh, not forcefully, but very uh, insistently, <laughs> educated us different. And that's one of the things I think lots of people today still get confused about. Who are the Métis and what does it mean to be Métis? Like you've said, you get asked all the time, fairly I... often, how much yeah. Métis are you? Yes. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> so, I, I, I've really had to resist. I've learned not to say, well, I think this side, this ear is Métis <laughs> and my left hand is Métis. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and I've said that, I've had to educate the people I've talked to that that's not an, an issue. You either are Métis or you aren't Métis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, do you feel Métis and has somebody claimed you as Métis and can you prove the genealogy or the acceptance in, yeah. into the... In, you know, into the nation, so... Um, and being Métis doesn't necessarily, well, it really 
in Western Canada does not mean being of mixed blood so much as particular cultures and settlements mm -hmm. of like way back when indigenous and Europeans who then began to create their own cultures and language and mm -hmm. ways of understanding themselves. So it's not like, yeah, it's not as though one of your parents was 100% European ancestry and another was 100% Cree and yeah. your Métis, it's yeah. because you come from a long cultural line of people who identified as Métis. I, the difference between you and me is that I grew up surrounded by uh, a family that was ob obviously Aboriginal yeah. in their background somewhere. Um, and genetics are such a weird thing. So my cousin uh, looks stereotypically like he would be Métis or maybe First Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, yet I'm obviously obviously white to the very first at the very first glance. Mm -hmm. um, so the genetics uh, isn't the overarching overwhelming way that we can identify each other. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, his life was very different than my life, and some of that was because of his skin color. Yeah. Um, and I had many more privileges granted to me than mm -hmm. he had. Yeah. And I, that always angered me mm -hmm. and made me sad. Um, and it's kind of one of the reasons why I really went in and, and found out what I needed to do to become accepted as a Métis person because why should the rest of my family mm, be discriminated against and I'm not and that just wasn't just, that mm. wasn't fair, that wasn't right. Um, so in some ways it was a statement to my family saying if I can do it you can sure as heck do it, let's go, you know, and, and several of us cousins got together and sort of supported each other into that, into that uh, time of applications and I don't know, getting our cards and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Thank you, Adele, for anybody who was interested um, in, in reading um, my reflection for the 40 days on anti-racism, Adele, just put it in the chat. So um, I guess I'm wondering if if there are questions or, or comments from folks so far about, um, about anything that my dad and I have talked about, either here live in our time together or in that piece of the conversation that you just heard and watched us have. And if you do have questions or comments, I think folks are putting them in the chat, right? Yes, yeah. So far, just what's emerging is just affirmation and what a great conversation. And thanks to both of you. Thank you. Don't be shy to ask anything. We're not shy. Especially you. And I wonder too, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's an interesting piece about having conversations um, with questions that we came up with beforehand is this recognition that um, there's still always more, more to talk about. Um, each piece of a conversation just opens up more questions. Yeah. Now I'm trying to think I should have written down dad some of the questions that I had for you that I didn't ask when we were talking <laughs> together. Why did I do the things I did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, There's a note, a note you, here Jim. that it that it's uh, it was particularly particularly helpful to hear the explanation of 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 Métis of the Métis Nation. So, um, and uh, another note around uh, the importance of hearing the importance of feeling like you belong that you belong to the land. So, wonder if you might want to comment about any of those. I had a, a basically a a real settler, <laughs> somebody whose family had come in here in about. Mm, 1905 and was very proud that they have been here for a little over a hundred years and they were sort of going on and on about that and then they, they turned to me and said so when did your people come and how long have you been here and it was it was just too hard to resist I had to say well I don't know I think it's about 14,000 years now um, <laughs> you know and it, it was uh there was quite a lull in the conversation at that point. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's only one side of my family. The other side of my family was, uh, uh, came from basically up from North Dakota to, to stake a, a claim here in, in Alberta. Around, you know, 1903, about there was when my grandfather on the settler side came up. But still, it, it was kind of fun. <laughs> Those, uh, I, I like to be a bit provocative now and then, but there's a difference when you know that your family on both sides has been around the area for two to 300 years to several thousand years. Uh, yeah. For me, um, I don't quite know how to explain it other than um when i when i visit back home in alberta i really do get this feeling in my chest it's like this sense of knowing that not only am i from here but actually i belong here like there is nowhere else that I could be from, but here. And, um, and as I've grown older, I've also come to understand that, that feeling as a sense of, um, maybe the word is responsibility, like there's a belonging as well as a need to care for the land as well. Like I belong to the land. It's not that necessarily the land belongs to me, but that we belong together. But um, somebody um, a little while ago talked a bit about up in the chat about hearing an explanation of what is Métis as a cultural nation. And um, I do talk a little bit about this in my written reflection for the 40 days, but um, one of the most important ways that Métis people have to introduce ourselves is our ancestral names. So for my dad and I, um, the main family names are the Prudens, the Whitfords, the Norns, and the Desjardins. And, um, just like what he was saying in the video about that, it, it almost locates you within the nation. Um, and that, that really is important to remember as well, that we belong to the land and, and these people, these ancestors have belonged to the land for a long, long time. So there have been a number of questions that have emerged in the chat. I wonder if I can read them all out and please feel free to choose. One question is, could you please speak a bit about how, the new, how your newfound identity is lived out by each of you now? Another question just notes that there's been a lot of resonance um, with this particular person and um, understanding how you may be getting uh, questions related to percentage of Métis. Um, so it's a, a note around appreciation of your comment relating to cultural definition. Uh, a question here is, what is the relationship between Métis and First Nations people of Canada? 
Is it good or is there some animosity? Um, are you supportive of one another as indigenous peoples? Um, there are, uh, well, maybe I'll pause there. There's three more questions, but uh, that, that's a lot to start with. And then I'll raise the other three that are there for now. Boy, that's a mixed bag. <laughs> so um, as far as, I, I wanna clarify something in that uh, the word newfound identity is really quite an interesting one in that when I go through the checklist of what are the essential cultural differences, our, my family always felt different. Um, we, I just didn't know why really. And so when you mean my from family, other white people, right? Pardon? You mean different from other white people? Yes, very much. So. For, from all of our neighbors, you know, I, I'm sort of, you know, I, I'm, I haven't moved around a lot. I haven't lived a lot of the places. I've always lived here and had the same neighbors. And our family never really was quite identical to the other people around us. Um, and it was a little hard to figure out why. And um, the best thing that happened for me in my racial perceptions was uh, discovering that there was a reason. <laughs> my mom had lived differently than many other children when she was raised. And uh, and she brought that to our family. And so I think we speak a little later about that, but it, I think it's important to realize that I, uh, when I say I was raised white, I was treated white by everybody else around me. I was treated as one of our family when we were within the family and it didn't matter that I was white and it didn't, didn't matter that somebody was black or Chinese or whatever, because there was that appreciation of we are people. Um, and a lot of times I was very confused about family relationships because so many people were kind of accepted. And once you're accepted, you were family. And it's not just, oh, yeah, you're my cousin's cousin. No, it's like people can come and live with you and people can, you know, <laughs> borrow money without question. And, and somebody's going to drop off a chunk of moose just for no particular reason. And you know, there was, there was all these things that were cultural and you weren't a direct relation. You were just accepted as part of the family. Now you just didn't seem to like, uh, it seemed like it didn't happen automatically. You had to kind of earn some trust and earn your chops. But once you were in, you, you were accepted and incorporated into our culture, which is really quite different from what I saw around us. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but anyway, Penny. Um, we, Dad, you and I had talked a bit about, like, if we could say it like this, like, I do, I do Métis different than you do, right? Like, yes. uh, you've said, you really hate smudging. You're not a big fan of how it smells. Um, you're not you don't really enjoy that whereas for me like that's a meaningful spiritual practice <laughs> you'd much rather pass on that <laughs> oh yeah yeah um to me it, it, it i'm a quite a um, ardent non-smoker and it smells like tobacco it smells like somebody's been smoking in my house which i usually throw people out when that happens <laughs> see uh, whether you're relative or not hey right uh, I think I'm much more involved um, in the history and the politics mm -hmm. of life. So what's the difference between Indigenous people, First Nations people, uh, Métis people? The Métis are very much a political entity. And right from the beginning of their existence, they were paid a lot of attention to organization and the, the law of the hunt and organizing their communities with elected, you know, elected representatives. And this is much before Canada showed up. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm very passionate about uh, the land rights for Métis. And I, I see you as being much more passionate about the cultural aspects of Métis. I couldn't speak 
I mean, chief, if I tried, but I, I can't speak French, French at all either, even though I tried. So um, that's one of the differences. And mm -hmm. between the various Aboriginal peoples is very complex. And there's a history that goes back hundreds of years that most people aren't aware of. Um, the, you know, the Métis and some Aboriginal tribes were just tight. Others were, we were at war with. Um, and I'm not talking about you know, sort of shaking fists at each other. Um, so, and present day uh, politics is very, very complicated, even within the Métis nations, as we each seek to define what our rights actually are, often through the courts. So um, it isn't, and somebody winning might mean another Aboriginal nation is losing. So it gets, it gets pretty tangled. Um, and I think we cooperate when we can, but we're very jealous of our own culture and the way that gov other governments should treat us. So there's, it's, that's why I said at the very, very start, this is a simple definition because you can have that debate for hours and hours with somebody from Southern Ontario versus Northern Ontario and are you AT really an AT and are, are you just mixed? Well, I hate this term, but mixed blood. Mm -hmm. Is there, you know, cultures have married together and now you're Métis? Well, yeah, not really. Maybe, I won't say not really, but okay. You know, like there's so many answers to that and each of the Métis nations answer them differently. Yeah, there are, um... It's important to note too, so my dad is a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta, but so there is one nation, the, the Métis Nation, but there are also these different organizations, for lack of a better word, within Canada. There's the Métis Nation of BC, of Alberta, the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan, the Manitoba Métis Federation and the Métis Nation of Ontario. Um, they all reside within the historical homeland, but within the capital T nation there, as my dad was saying, there is vying for, for rights and all sorts of things. But Think of them um, as provinces. That's yeah. not an accurate de definition, but it really is close. So the provinces will sometimes gang up in the federal government and then sometimes they'll work for themselves. And it's the same way within the, the politics of the Indigenous nations. But it is, it's important to note too, so when, um, when there was the Indigenous delegation that went to visit the Pope earlier this year, that um, the Métis National Council chairperson, um, Cassidy Caron, she went as a representative of the entire Métis Nation along um, with um, folks from the First Nations and the Inuit delegation as well. So there is cooperation between the three recognized Indigenous groups within Canada on certain mm -hmm. issues for sure. There's also groups in other provinces that claim Métis staff and that, get, that gets sort of really confusing. Yeah, I don't think we should go into that, Dad. Okay, sorry, I, my interest is... I'm using my veto card. <laughs> <laughs> you win. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll take this opportunity to, to weave in some additional questions that have come in, into the chat. Uh, so one, um, or sorry, the same question. So one is, do you experience any inner conflict between your Métis and your Norwegian identities? And if so, how do you resolve or live with that? Another question is naming that this person's spouse is Anglo-Indian. Do you see any commonalities with other mixed race ethnicities? And what are your views on colorism from a Métis perspective? Oh, yeah. And then this question is directed to you, Penny. In your experience, what are some of the differences you experience? Sorry, in, in your experience, what are some of the differences you experience between the acknowledgement of the Métis in the West versus the East? 
So that person just took away the veto card. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one of the hardest questions to answer or most mm, difficult is, uh, did I have any conflict with my Norwegian settler culture and the Métis culture? And the answer is yes, and I'm quite ashamed by it. That I was, I grew up hearing, you know, about kids playing cowboys and Indians, and everybody wanted to be the cowboy, and I wanted to be the cowboy. And uh, Then uh, racial jokes were told all the time, um, mostly about Ukrainians and Indians. Um, and I kind of went along with it, you know, <laughs> didn't argue, didn't put up any defense. And the other thing is, is that I was becoming mm, somewhat hostile to some of my family members because of their stereotypical um, behaviors. So to be just blunt, uh, they were several of my family are and were alcoholics and there was family violence and uh, there were behaviors that did not shine well on our uh, our culture and I was quite angry with them and I started down a very dark path of identifying uh, racial characteristics to them instead of uh, really looking at what the issue was. And the issue really was poverty. It wasn't that they were, their skin color was making them act in this way. It was really that many of my family grew up um, persecuted and very, very poor in, in that we have trouble actually, most of us in our area who are pretty middle class have, can't understand uh, what deep, deep poverty does to somebody's spirit. And so, you know, we can describe things that were happening in the 1930s and lots of people said, oh yeah, we were poor. My family was poor. My grandma had talked about not having shoes. Well, that described many of my family members in the 60s and 70s. So there was wealth all around them and they were having trouble feeding their families and they couldn't find a job and, and uh, they were being discriminated against and they were being beat up in the bars and stuff like that. So with that kind of oppression, it becomes very difficult to not slide into some defensive behaviors. And it was such a relief for me to realize that, you know, what's the real issue here? The issue isn't race. The issue wasn't culture. The issue was a shared deep poverty with uh, brutal, and I don't use that word lightly, brutal discrimination against them that held them, and that squished them, that flattened their hopes uh, and left them in a, you know, just an awful, awful way to live. Anyway, I think I'm done for a while. I... To answer that question for me, um, not so much about our Norwegian identity, but um, on my mom's side of the family, she has uh, ancestors who were very proud orange men who, and orange men um, were a group of Protestant Irish, I think that's right. Um, but generally just like militant Protestants in Canada um, who, who really were working to, uh, to enforce Anglo-Protestantism across the country. And uh, the Orangemen were um, historical persecutors of uh, many Métis communities and people. So for me, like, it's interesting to, to live with this tension of like, I am the product of Norwegian and Swedish settlers and proud orange men and indigenous people. And, um, and, and I am, uh, visually as white as a ghost. Like I also live with 
with all of these tensions that I do not present um, to, on the surface to other people as indigenous. I have not necessarily come to like a clean and tidy place with these tensions within me of how do, how do I live with all of my ancestors, not, not just the ones that I am comfortable with. <laughs> um, so I don't have an answer to that question besides the fact that um, I think it's something that is important for uh, settlers and indigenous peoples to continue to wrestle with of what are our histories and who are we now and how, how do we integrate all of that together? Because I am, I am the product of all of that. Um, From a racist point of view, I think the Métis people would share a lot of similarities uh, mixed cultural and yeah. right groups. From a political point of view, um, we have a direct bone to pick with the federal government and the provincial governments as they have uh, frequently uh, denied rights that were signed and sealed by the government, previous governments. And so we're in we're in a political and um, economic fight with um, the culture of Canada, this, the, the political entity of Canada, uh, which is probably a little bit different than the other um, mixed race groups. Mixed race, ethnicities, yeah. I think the question of colorism within Métis communities is, is an interesting question too. And dad, because you actually live within the homeland and you've been able to like get together in person with more Métis gatherings of people. Do you notice within those gatherings, do people uh, within the Métis Nation of Alberta gatherings or like when you've gone to back to Batash days or whatever, have, do people treat people who present more Caucasian than others differently? Or are there, are there preferences that you see in those gatherings? Well, I got, you know, a rel outside of my family, I have relatively small experience with that, but I have never, ever been treated as non-Métis when I have been in a, a gathering or a meeting or any of that sort of stuff. Right. If you say you're Métis, you are Métis. I say I'm Métis. So I've never really been carded. People don't ask me for my card. If I yeah. stay Métis, they tend to accept that I'm Métis. And we mm -hmm. have a little family conversation. <laughs> oh, you're a prudent. You know? Yeah. And then that, that's the, the entry, I think. But uh, I, ha I have not noticed that. I've always felt mm, welcomed home. Um, and that's all I can say on that. And I haven't been everywhere and it hasn't been 30, 40 years of experience. So I do think within some of my conversations that I've had through um, Métis cultural programs that I've participated with, that there is some, sometimes some shame with those of us who are, who present as white, that um, and you talk a little bit about that in that last video, Dad, of how um, we do not face the same level of discrimination as Métis siblings and cousins do who are not white passing. And so I, I, that is something that I've noticed from a number of different people, this sense, and it it sometimes couples with the internal question of, am I Métis enough? Especially mm -hmm. if you present white. Um, because if you, if, if my life doesn't scream, I am Métis, people don't treat me like I am Métis. Um, and the next video actually talks a bit about that. Um, 
To the last question, Steve, about what are some of the differences you experience between the acknowledgement of Métis in the West versus the Métis in the East? The reason why I vetoed that part of the conversation <laughs> is, um, so the Métis Nation, the Métis National Council is very clear in its definition of Métis that um, uh, the Métis culture stems from within what is understood as a traditional um, bounds of the Métis homeland within Western Canada and um, the Dakotas and um, Northern Canada as well. And so for, uh, but there are groups out East um, in Nova Scotia, there's the, I don't remember what they're called, the Eastern Woodlands Métis. Um, and so there, this is a group of people who claim um, uh, mixed indigenous, like Mi'kmaq and um, French Acadian um, heritage. And um, whether or not that, that ancestry is real, um, that particular understanding of like their culture is different from um, the culture of, of the Métis people who, um, which grew out of a Western experience at a particular point in time. So there are a lot of internal politics <laughs> with Métis peoples across Canada about this question of who actually gets to call themselves Métis and whether um, people in Eastern Canada are allowed to be called Métis. Um, it's one of the reasons why I say I am Métis, but I'm not actually a citizen of the nation because I don't reside within the homeland. And um, I would be able to um, apply for citizenship through Manitoba because Manitoba, um, the Manitoba Métis Federation is willing to take citizens from wherever, as long as you can prove that you have uh, Métis genealogy. But um, I've chosen not to become a citizen of the Manitoba Métis Federation because of the long historical connection that my family has to the Beaver Hill country that we were talking about in, which is now in Alberta. Um, I feel like I belong to that particular part of the world. And so I don't want to, I'm not interested in being a member of the Eastern Woodlands Métis or the Manitoba Métis Federation because I don't belong to them and I don't belong to that place. I belong to, I belong to that particular place in the land that's now known as Alberta. I think we should maybe... Yeah, I agree. Um, I wonder if we could move into the second video and then any of the other questions that have been coming up, we could go to after the video. Thanks, Brian. Have you faced any issues or challenge from your circle of friends or your community um, about uh, claiming your status as Métis? about challenges so much, but I do think <clears throat> that people who have known me all my life because uh, not only do I present as white, blonde hair, blue eyes, um, but also for almost all of my life, I really only understood myself to be mm -hmm. white. Um, so I think for people who have known me all my life, that was pretty weird to, it was like, a, it was like coming out of the closet. Like, I have sometimes likened being a white passing Métis person to being bisexual, which I also am. So I, for being bi, often, like, 
most times nobody can look at you and be like, that person is bisexual. <laughs> and, um, so it, it comes as a surprise when you come out of the closet and you say, I'm bi or I'm Métis. And um, yeah, especially when, when folks I've known all my life had never thought mm -hmm. of me as indigenous. And for most of my life, I had also never connected the ways in which I was raised or my worldviews as indigenous either. So, mm -hmm. like, I face challenges even within myself still as to whether or not I am Métis enough to be Métis. <laughs> um, and, I, yeah, like you and I, it's kind of strange how some of my cousins or even Sean, my brother, mm -hmm. Sean lives in Alberta, so he, and he's your kid, he is fully able to apply mm -hmm. to the Métis Nation of Alberta for citizenship, and he's said that he doesn't want to do that because he doesn't feel like he's Métis, and, or Métis enough to count. And I'm out here in Nova Scotia, I live outside the homeland, I would prefer to be a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta because I feel like our mm -hmm. family spent a good amount of time in that area. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can't claim citizenship of a nation and yet I feel like I belong. Right. So it's, it's weird how like one sibling can say I'm Métis and the other one says I'm not Métis yeah. enough to count and we have the same, same parents. Yeah. <laughs> Same genetics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Same upbringing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. For me, I have been challenged many times by particularly uh, people of my age or older. Mm -hmm. And I became quite angry several times as somebody, the question they asked me, so what do you get? Do you get free smokes? Yeah. And I, I'd say, well, I don't, I don't get anything. I'm just proclaiming who I am. Yeah, but you get to shoot a moose whenever you want, don't you? And I, and I'd say, well, you know, I don't hunt anymore. Mm. So for me, it, it isn't an issue to do that. Well, what about free fishing? Well, I said, well, I'm over 65. I can get a free fishing license just like anybody. And that angers them. Right. They seem to think that because I'm claiming to be Métis, that I have some special rights that somehow they're missing out on. Mm. And um, it, it's become easier as I mm, age into it uh, to not get angry, um, to, to then try to educate them on that. For me, it was a, more of a social justice issue and an acknowledgement of what was real mm -hmm. for me. I grew up surrounded by many more um, indigenous people than you did. Yeah. Um, as our family dispersed a little bit, we weren't nearly as close. You weren't, you weren't brought to the, you know, the Sutton family, Sutton family, farm. family farm very often or the, by then my grandma had passed on and that was sort of the pin that held the clan together and mm -hmm. we've dispersed somewhat so that uh, but I learned a lot as a child, um, a lot of skills, talents, attitudes that my friends in the farming community weren't taught. Mm. Um, so that it was kind of a, a hidden education that it wasn't until I actually started talking to other uh, people with Métis identities that I, I learned, oh, geez, I, we learned a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. um, how to be, how to treat family, what was really important in life. Uh, it's been very interesting talking to them about the nature of the land and them themselves. Because yeah. my neighbors, uh, they uh, bulldoze from 
quarter section to quarter section to get rid of all the trees. Mm -hmm. And I leave a little stream through our property. And I was taught that the, the rabbits needed some place to hide from the hawks. So why would you bulldoze down all those trees and yeah. to leave strips of grain for the deer to eat as thanking them for giving them a chance, thanking them for being our food supply too. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know that was terribly different. Uh, <laughs> you know, like they weren't being taught the same things. They were taught that mm -hmm. they owned the land. I was being taught that we live on the land and manage it. And uh, that made accepting uh, being part of the Métis Nation, I think, easier for me than mm -hmm. it was for you. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Um, I think, it, like, you and I have talked a little bit, too, about why do we choose to claim yeah. Métis identity. And for me, one of the things that has been really important, especially because I'm white passing, is um, like it occurred to me uh, that the the Canadian government and the church's policies of assimilation would have succeeded in our family yes if I did not choose to claim my Métis identity and that made me angry <laughs> so for me i a big part of why i choose to actively claim my metis identity is because i refuse to allow the policies of assimilation to succeed and that actually is something that is very Métis. Like we were <laughs> born out of resistance yes. in many ways. And so, as well as just like having a good time, yeah. like fiddle music and dancing. But I did a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I think to me claiming my Métis heritage is a challenge to to uh, Canadian history, not just angrily, like yes. also to embrace it. One of, one of my particular challenges that I've struggled with, I've struggled with over the past few years is trying to learn how to hold equally um, my Métis heritage and identity alongside all of my other European heritage and mm -hmm. identity because I'm just as Norwegian and Swedish and Scottish and right. Irish and whatever else as, as I am Métis. And, and I think that that's important is to not necessarily swing from pole to pole, but to, to try to hold things in balance. Hmm. So for, for me, it was more of a feeling of coming home because mm. uh, I really didn't fit in. Like I farmed all my life, but I really didn't fit in to the farming community. Yeah. We, we just didn't believe the same things. And when I started to discover a nation of people living around me <laughs> um, that did believe in many of the things, and I've had many, many moments where, you know, I've claimed my heritage and somebody else be sitting in the same group has, has quietly said, I, I, I am too, yeah. you know, the, the, and then we get to talking and we have a shared history, family history and lifestyle it was very similar. Mm -hmm. And it started, it was like a, I don't know, it's just a warm feeling yeah. coming home. Things felt better with this group of people. And, uh, I, I didn't feel quite so isolated, though there's no one in my neighborhood, our area, that is claiming Métis status, but still, in our bigger community, there are. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that's been an eye-opener for me and, and a good feeling. Mm -hmm. 
there was more conversation after that, but as you can probably tell when you get me and my dad talking, we can just talk for a really long time. <laughs> that was where we thought we should, where we thought we should probably end our pre-recorded conversation. Um, and so I wonder either if there have been other questions that you haven't had a chance yet to ask, or if there were moments from that last chunk of video that that had you wondering anything in particular. Janet, to answer your question, I did answer it in the chat, but yes, the motif on my shirt, um, it is a Métis floral motif. They're, one of the names that the Métis people um, have been given over time is the flower beadwork people. And uh, we are really, really known for our floral beadwork. And so um, this particular, I've got it on today too, this particular motif, um, there are a number of uh, traditional Métis floral patterns. And so that's one of them. There's just some additional notes of thanks in the chat for both of you. I have another comment that comes from my political and historical interest and that the difference of the Métis nation was that we had actually formed a government and a nation um, be after the Hudson's Bay Company had, had uh, abandoned the land and the governor of Canada claimed the land. And we, uh, as a nation, applied to be a province. And there were more, pe more people who were Métis than there were in Prince Edward Island. So we figured, hey, well, Canada, it, it's, there was actually a discussion. Do we want to join the US or do we want to join Canada? And, and the feeling then was that Canada probably fit our um, lifestyles better. And the Canadian government answered by sending the army. Um, they sort of faked negotiations and then we, the homeland was invaded and uh, the Métis people actively resisted it. But um, big guns count. And uh, <clears throat> their army was more organized and better supplied than our army. So we, we became a conquered people, but we still resisted. There was active resistance and, and people fled the area that had been taken over and moved west, hopefully out of the range of the Canadian government. Canadian government followed and we resisted again and were thoroughly squashed the last time. Not all May people fought um, and we, the um, alliances that we had with the uh, First Nations people were, were actively broken up and we were, there was a great deal of effort put into pitting ourselves, to make us pit ourselves against the First Nations, uh, to break any further Indian alliance that might come up. And uh, so there's that piece of history that's still with the Métis people. There was no rebellion, there was a resistance and only because we were treated so unjustly. Mm -hmm and hor atrocities were committed and, and communities were burned. And, and we're not talking sort of tents burning down. We had churches and businesses and um, Winnipeg was quite a thriving city. <laughs> yeah. and, and they marched in and, and basically took it over and they sent the surveyors out and uh, redistributed the land and then made promises to uh, uh, give us another section of land and, that went into the Manitoba Act, which is a piece of federal legislation, million acres. And that was uh, totally ignored and never reckoned, mm -hmm. never settled, never put into treaty. So um, there, there's, there's a, a feeling there about we're still fighting for our rights and we're, we're still trying to join Canada. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important too to recognize that like even when I was in school in the 90s that um, 
the resistances that you were naming, Dad, like Canadian textbooks called them the Red River Rebellion and the Northwest Rebellion. But the way that the way that the Métis people remember the history is that it wasn't a rebellion. It it was resisting the army that was invading land that we had peacefully and legally been settling in the first place. And so a reminder too of who who has the power to who gets to tell the stories in in different ways. And that's important to remember too. But Question. yeah, like your point too about you remember this past summer, I saw a Gatling gun um, at uh, in Halifax at one of the museums, and the Gatling gun was used at the Battle of Batash, and that was like an old olden times machine gun against people who would not have had that kind of firepower. Like it's ridiculous that our own government used that kind of firepower on its citizens. And we not, it's not ridiculous, join. it's atrocious. Yeah, exactly. We have tried to join. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody asked about a good resource, a good book, and The Northwest is My Mother. Is Our Mother. Excellent resource book. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the author name, though. Penny? I... Yeah, um, she is the great grand niece of Louis Riel. Um, I'm just Googling it right now. It is a fantastic history book. Uh, yeah, here we go. By Jean Tillet. I'll put that link in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody mentioned Sh Sharon had her hand up. I'm looking, was it Sharon Van Cleef? I'm just trying to see if there were other Sharons. Sharon, if you did have a question, are you able to put your hand up again just so that I know for sure that it was? Oh, okay, all right. Well, I'm really grateful for all you folks who came out today to have this conversation with us. Also a special shout out to Uncle Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> who is here. <laughs> it's really nice to see family as well supporting us too. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who has been interested in, um, in learning a little bit more about what it means, at least to me and to my dad, to be Métis. And as well, I think it's interesting that um, we're having this conversation conversation <laughs> that we're having this conversation on All Saints Day um, and between All Saints and All Souls um, these two feast days of being willing to reflect on our on our ancestors um, so if it is okay I I'd actually like to close our time together with a prayer that I am still learning how to say in Michif. Um, this prayer uh, comes from Samson Lamontagne, who um, created this prayer with the help of Norman Fleury, who is one of the elders within the Métis community. And so I'd ask you, I'd ask you to join your hearts with mine as we pray together. Au nom du Père, et du Fils, et le Saint-Esprit, ainsi soit-il. 
Merci, Créateur, pour ma famille, pour mes amis, pour ma santé. Merci, Créateur. Au nom du Père et du Fils et le Saint-Esprit, en ce switch. Merci. So in that prayer, we thanked God for our family, our friends, and our health. Thank you for being a part of this time. And thank you, Penny and Brian, for, for leading us in this time. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. No, just thank you for allowing us to share the story. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, Penny and Brian, for sharing your stories and uh, and so much. There's was, there was so many notes in the chat just offering thanks and appreciation for this conversation. So thank you very much for all that you've shared um, and all of your insights. It's very much appreciated and helpful for us all. So thanks for everyone again for, for coming today and um, blessings on your day ahead. And please feel free to tune in to additional 40 Days Live events and to follow the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. Blessings on your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, folks.